Today I'd like to introduce you to the ideal lab test for improving hormone health. So we're going to be talking about measuring adrenal hormones and sex hormones. And typically when those are measured, you have three options, either measuring them in blood, which is serum usually, or in saliva, or in urine, which is typically a 24-hour collection. So when we're looking at these hormones, starting with adrenal hormones, you know, you can measure those in any of the three, serum, saliva, urine. Typically with adrenal hormones like cortisol, serum's not... Uh, as good of an option because you're measuring a stress hormone uh, by way of an action, a blood draw, that's actually stressful. And so there's some other drawbacks there. And people are typically looking at adrenal hormones in saliva or maybe in urine. Uh, with sex hormones, though, serum testing becomes predominant as it's uh, usually uh, what's favored by a lot of doctors, although you can also measure these things in urine and in saliva. Saliva is probably uh, the most difficult analytically, so you want to make sure that you're working with a lab that's got a good handle on uh, how to measure those in the laboratory. But when we want to look at a, a comprehensive overview of what's going on with a the patient, there's more that we'd like to look at than just the parent hormones of these adrenal and sex hormones. So for the adrenal hormones, we don't want to just look at free cortisol. We'd really rather look at the daily pattern of free cortisol as it starts high in the morning and goes down throughout the day. And to do that, we really only have currently the option of saliva testing. But we'd also like to look at how cortisol is metabolized because we know there's some dysfunction going on with the metabolism picture of cortisol with things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue and uh, various other conditions. And so we'd like to look at that as well. Uh, however, that's typically only going to be available in urine testing. So we can see some holes here in terms of trying to get a comprehensive look at adrenal hormones. Now for sex hormones, if we want to get a little bit more expansive in terms of our overview, we'd like to look at not just the parent hormones, but the metabolites. So instead of just estradiol or estrone for your estrogens, you'd also like to look at the 2 and the 4 and the 16 hydroxy estrogen to see how estrogen is being metabolized and how that might play into things like cancer risks. Uh, we'd also like to look at not just testosterone, but also dihydrotestosterone and some of the other androgen metabolites. And those are usually best measured in urine, although you can measure some of those in serum, but definitely not in saliva. So looking at the landscaping of, landscape of testing, you can see that there are some holes and deficiencies in each one of these. And so we really have to make some choices in terms of which information we're having to give up as we make our choice of a hormone test. Uh, the urine testing presents as a promising option because the only thing that's really missing from all of these parameters is the diurnal cortisol pattern. And so when we look at the diurnal cortisol pattern, if we can add that back into urine testing, you have a very nice comprehensive test. So cortisol throughout the day is going to start uh, somewhat low and then it's going to very quickly go up to its peak around 30-40 minutes after waking and then it starts a slow descent uh, until bedtime and actually keeps going down until about two in the morning. So in this case, they were looking at healthy controls and then also chronic fatigue patients. And you can see that the patients with chronic fatigue have the same type of pattern, but it's lower across the board throughout the day as they have a deficiency in cortisol. And so these researchers did the same thing looking at urinary levels and you can see an almost superimposable pattern when you look at the urinary free cortisol uh, throughout the day with these spot samples. And so we really think this opens up a better way to test to comprehensively look at all of these hormones by instead of using a 24-hour urine collection using four specifically timed urine collections. So we test the individual samples for free cortisol which provides us with this diurnal free cortisol pattern and then we take the four samples and make a weighted average of those and test for all the other hormones so the cortisol, progesterone, estrogen, and androgen metabolites and if those values can correlate well to a 24-hour value, then you have a very simple, very comprehensive hormone test. And so if we look at these values being on the x-axis, the 24-hour uh, classic collection for urine, and then these four spot samples, you can see a very strong 
correlation, making it a viable alternative to a 24-hour sample. So this really creates a better way to test hormones where you can see your adrenal hormones, the diurnal cortisol pattern, the metabolism pattern of cortisol, sex hormones and metabolites, and by way of the collection itself, its very nature, it becomes a very easy collection, which is also a nice advantage. So to make the collection even easier than for spot individual liquid samples, we're using dried urine collection so you can see the urine collection device here and on the bottom half then is filter paper and the patients are either urinating directly on it or urinating into a plastic or paper cup and then dipping them and then the, the little sticker handle is where their name and time of collection goes and then that's used to hang it up on a towel rack or a counter edge and then once those are dry after 24 hours then you can simply peel those off and send them into the lab for analysis and you can see that the dry collection is extremely accurate relative to the liquid urine values and provides us with a very nice alternative collection that's not as difficult for the patient. So once we have a very comprehensive, a very simple test to do, uh, we need to make sure that it's in a palatable uh, arrangement in terms of understanding the results because there there's a lot of information in this test. So we're going to present it as a classic lab report with just simply the names of the hormones and the reference ranges and the values. Uh, but what makes it a little bit easier to understand is to put it in a little bit of context in a more dynamic report where you can see the hormones in the context of the reference range, but also within the context of the hormonal cascade as these hormones are converted from one to another. So the dynamic lab report helps you and the patient really be able to understand uh, what's going on with a patient's hormones. So for example, for the adrenal hormones, uh, the report allows you to really just explain what's going on. We're talking about the HPA axis. And what is that? The hypothalamus, which creates hormones that the pituitary, both of which are in the brain, of course, are going to act on and make ACTH. And ACTH is going to stimulate your adrenal glands to make a series of hormones, including DHEAS and cortisol. And then we can see further how that cortisol is metabolized, how it's converted to cortisone, and then how those are metabolized to the cortisol metabolites. And so if we look a little bit closer here, we can see some important distinctions because of the information that we have. So we can look at this patient's cortisol, and you can see that they're relatively deficient for cortisol. But if you look at their cortisol metabolites, you can see that they're somewhat elevated. And so what that tells us about this patient is they don't have a lot of cortisol, but it's not because they're not making very much cortisol. It's because the cortisol and the cortisone metabolism is very much upregulated, which you see in a number of different cases. You see it in obesity. You see it in long-term stress and a number of situations where uh, if you don't have all this information and you're really just looking at free cortisol, then you don't understand that this patient is actually making a lot of cortisol, which is in contrast to a patient like this who has, again, low free cortisol levels, but you can see that the cortisol metabolites are quite low as well. So here's a person who's truly adrenally insufficient, even though their body is preferring cortisol to cortisone and it's tr really trying to have as much cortisol as it can have, it's just not making enough to, enough to keep up with the body's demand. So again, these two situations where you've got a metabolism issue as opposed to a production issue are going to present different clinically and we need to treat those patients differently. But firstly, we need to be able to distinguish between them and that's really the point of testing all of these different parameters within the patient. So lastly, once we've looked at all of these different parameters, we need to also have uh, some information to help us digest that. And so each of the report then comes with some generic information to explain you know, each of the sections uh, and each of the things uh, that we're measuring, but then also some very specific uh, comments to the particular patient to try to understand a little bit about the particular pattern that this patient is showing. So when you put them all together, the collection and then the reporting in terms of its comprehensiveness, we really have simply better testing. And if you would like some information on using this exciting urine test uh, in your practice, 
then please do feel free to reach out to us at info at urinehormones.com. And you can also visit us at our website at www.urinehormones.com.